on Auschwitz. The history of Auschwitz is exceptionally complex. It combined two functions, a concentration camp and extermination center. Nazi Germany persecuted various groups of people there and the camp complex was continually expanded and transformed. In the podcast on Auschwitz, we discuss the details of the history of the camp, as well as our contemporary memory of this important and special place. One of the prisoners in the first transport of women to Auschwitz, 999 women transferred from Ravensbrück concentration camp in March 1942, was Sophie Stiepel. She was registered as prisoner number 619. She was arrested because she belonged to the group of Jehovah's Witnesses. A few days after arrival, Sophie was employed as the domestic helper in the villa of the camp commandant Rudolf Hess, which probably saved her life. Her duties included shopping and cooking, and sometimes taking care of the commandant's children. Teresa von der Cichy of the Auschwitz Museum Research Center tells about the story of Sophie Stiebel. Who was Sophie Stiebel? Sophie Stiebel was born in 1892 in Mannheim, in a middle-class family. She attended the high school and she got the qualification to be the office worker. So one of her job was in a court as an office person. In 1915, she got married. She married Friedrich Stiepel. And the young couple welcomed the first daughter in 1916. That was Edith, that was the name of the daughter. Still, their family life was very happy. She was taking care of the child. And in 1921, the second daughter, Amanda, was born. In 1929, the family faced huge difficulties and tragedy. The daughter, the youngest daughter, contracted Mejentagis. And this disease was deadly for her. So in 1929, little Amanda died. After this happened, Sophie was going through a very difficult time. She suffered from depression. And she was trying to look for some help, advice in different circumstances, in different societies around her. She was also approaching the religious life. She was a Protestant member of the Lutheran Church, but unfortunately all the meetings and all the people she was having around were not helpful, were not also ready to deal with someone who was in a, such a difficult moment. And then she met uh, Bible students. At that time, this is how this organization was called, Bibelforscher, that, that was the German name. And the contact, the way of uh, discussion, the analysis of a Bible were very helpful for Sophie. She felt as her condition is improving, so shortly after the first meetings, she started to bring her daughter, elder daughter Edith, for the meetings. Her husband was not participating, but he supported her financially in traveling because of the meetings and also was supporting the fact that the daughter was member of these meetings. Sophie Stiepel was arrested for the very first time in 1936. That happened in Mannheim, when the group she was member of was reported to the police. Generally, the activities, any type of meetings of Bible students and Jehovah Witnesses were forbidden. Jehovah's Witnesses, it's a, another group which was part of Bible students. They started to exist separately in mid 30s as more active 
part of this previous organization. And Sophie Stiepel wanted to stay with the more active members. So uh, they were having some meetings, they were reported, and Sophie Stiepel was first taken for the camp in Moringen. She has to face the court, she has to face the trial, and she was there until 1938, so the next year, when she was moved to another camp, this time Lichtenburg. From Lichtenburg, again, she was moved for another place, this time that was Moringen. Moringen was having a little bit different character at that time. The inmates, they could be visited by the relatives, by the family members. So Sophie was visited by her husband and the daughter. And her husband wanted Sophie to sign the document, which was stating that Sophie was not to have contact with Bible students, Bibelforscher, this term was used in the document, that she was declaring that she's aware that her beliefs were wrong. And in the future, after being released from the camp, she would stay away. She would stay apart from this organization. Sophie was constantly refusing signing this document. So this is why she was staying in the camp for that long. Sophie Stiepel was transferred to Auschwitz from Ravensbrück and her transport was at the same time the first transport of women to the camp. Why did the Germans transfer them to Auschwitz? The beginning of the female camp in Auschwitz, it's March 1942, when the very first group of women from Ravensbrück was deported. In the morning, that was 999 women from Ravensbrück. And the same day in the evening, also 999 female prisoners from camp in Poprad. They were Jewish Slovak women. The tradition of sending first the German prisoners was kept in different camps, especially the new established, as the first prisoners were usually in the camps for many years. So they knew the structure, they knew the tradition, they knew the schema, they knew how the prisoner's organization in the camp should look like, what kind of functions they should have in the camp in order to run the camp in the efficient way. So this is why the German prisoners who were in this first transport, in many cases were in different type of custody for many years. And in the camp, they were to be functionary prisoners. Some of them were very brutal, very abusive people, very sadistic individuals. And that was, of course, used on purpose to terrorize, efficiently terrorize the other female prisoners. Sophie Stiepel was registered as prisoner number 619. In the camp, she received an unusual work. She became a domestic help in the house of the camp commandant Rudolf Hess. What can we tell about her work in the commandant's house? What was the relation between her and the family of the commandant? About the beginning of Sofia Stiepel's work in commandant's house, we know actually from the testimony of Stanisław Dubiel the prisoner gardener who was sent for the duties in commandant's house. As we know, the villa was surrounded by the garden, which was specially built, specially arranged for the family, and they could spend their free time in the garden and in a patio specially built for them. Sofia Stiepel, as Dubiel is saying, was coming from the same place, from uh, the same city, Mannheim, as his family used to live. It's actually the only source of information. He's saying that during the first days of women in Auschwitz camp, when Rudolf Hiss was to visit, was to watch how the organization looked like, he might have recognized her her face was to be familiar for him. And this is why he chose Sophie Stiepel for this work. But that's the only source of information. Sophie Stiepel was not alone as a housekeeper in a commandant's house. There was also Gertruda Blask, 
probably she was in the same transport, but we don't know her camp number or her category. Probably she was also with purple triangle, she was also Jehovah's Witness. About the duties of Sofia Stipel, we know from the testimonies of different prisoners. Unfortunately, neither Sofia Stipel nor Gertruda Blask spoke about that. Nothing was written down. We don't have their voice, her voice, I mean Sophie Stiepel. Another source, which is pretty surprising, Rudolf Hus, uh, during his trial, when he was in the prison, he was writing a memoir. And in one of the chapters, he was uh, also including a passage about the Jehovah's Witnesses being in his, uh, in his house. I employed two elderly women in my house for three years. My wife would often say that she could not take better care of everything than those two women. We were moved how loving they looked after children, both those older and the little ones. Our children were attached to them just as if they were members of our family. At first we were worried that they may attempt to gain the children for Jehovah, but they did not do that. They never spoke to children about religious matters. Given their fanaticism, it was surprising, generally, the Bible students were content with their faith. The two prisoners were to take care of the house, were to cook. The cooking was easier for Sophie Stiepel because the wife actually was having everything she needed for the kitchen. We know that war was bringing many difficulties in providing some products. In Germany, people were having the rations for food. Here, any type of flour, sugar, rice, cinnamon, and any other products were sent for the kitchen of the commandant's house. So they were to cook, they were to take care of the children of the house. And there was one more prisoner in the house and she was a tailor. So she was to make the clothes for the, for the children. Sophie Stiepel was arrested for being a Jehovah's Witness. Did it influence her situation in the camp? Sofia Stiepel was a member of this religious group. She was arrested because she was Bible students. In German documentation, we've got the term Bibelforscher, what means Bible students. And they were being known as people who are very disciplined in terms of work, as long as the task is not connected with military, with violence, is going to be done in the best possible way. Then in the camp, not to jeopardize the other prisoners, they were not trying to escape. So if the female prisoners were sent for the town to do shopping or for some other duties, it was known that they will be back, that they will return to the camp, again because of this reason, not to risk the life of the other inmates. Then also in the camp they were visible because of the different distinguishing marks. They were being given purple triangle, so they were being seen as another group, as another category. Then in terms of housekeeping, as most of the first prisoners with purple triangle, they were German, so they knew the German lifestyle, the tradition, how to keep the house, how to organize the life, everyday life, how to take care of the children was for the families known easier. And this is why many of them were taken for the families of the SS officers as the housekeepers. Sophie Stiepel somehow was connected, was tied with Commandant Hus and his family. All her staying in the camp was around the family. And even some very personal element of connection, Mannheim, her hometown and the place where his family 
used to live as well is seen as the matching point. But something else happened to her personal, very personal family life. That was in 1943, in March 1943, uh, when Commandant Hiss was to present a special documentation for her and that was to be presented for the court. Her husband, Friedrich Stiepel, he filed for the divorce. He wanted his wife to sign the documentation to be released from the camp, and Sophie was constantly refusing to accept this. So eventually, in 1943, the court was to deal with the divorce procedure, and her brother, Willi Greiner, was to represent her. And Commandant Hiss issued this document, very personal document for Sophie Stippel and her brother to be presented for the court in Mannheim. And in January 1944, she got divorced. She was still in touch with her daughter, Edith. She was adult already. She got married and she was a mother. She gave birth to a son, so Sophie Stiepel was a grandmother. And the connection between the daughter and the mother was very fresh and was very, very present. What happened to Sophie during the period of evacuation of Auschwitz and what was her later fate? Evacuation of the camp was also evacuation for the families. And we know that in November 1944, the family was packing their belongings and moving for Ravensbrück. And this is what happened also to Sophie Stiepel. She was sent again for Ravensbrück, so it's for her like the return. And being there again, she was sent for some work for for the families, for the administration. Later on, as the family, his family moved towards the relatives, she stayed in Ravensbrück and she was liberated there. She was taken for some recovery. We may see her documents from the camp with the inscription in Russian and in French. And she was back to family members. The first people she met was her daughter and her mother and also the grandson, the little boy. She moved for Heidelberg, where her daughter was living, and she was there until 1985. She died being aged 93. And all the time she was very, very much in contact with Jehovah's Witnesses. She could not work much because of the health troubles she uh, suffered from heart attack so the experiences from the wartime the several camps she was through she was first arrested in 1936 and then she was until the end of the war in the camps so nine years so it's a long time so it all affected her health so this is why she stayed there being just a family member. All episodes of the On Auschwitz podcast are available at auschwitz.org slash podcasts. We kindly ask you to support our mission and share our podcast in social media.